We all know Leonardo da Vinci, his celebrated Mona Lisa, and his fumato. And yet this artist only produced about 15 paintings. What brought about his extraordinary fame? How can we explain the special place his work commands in the history of art? Leonardo considered painting as a superlative science, the only one through which the artist could represent life in its entirety. To achieve this, he allowed himself the freedom to carry out much wide research and try out many innovations. Through the re-reading of ancient texts and the latest technological advances, we have been able to take a fresh look at his approach and thus understand that his works were the result of many years of reflection and a very painstaking execution, which meant that most of his paintings remained unfinished. By bringing to each of his works a personal and poetic vision of the world, Leonardo da Vinci opened up a new approach to painting, that of modernity. Was it the quiet harmony of the Tuscan landscape that gave Leonardo da Vinci a taste for observing nature? It was in the heart of these hills, in the little village of Vinci, not far from Florence, that Leonardo was born on the 14th of April, 1452. Leonardo was the illegitimate son of a wealthy Florentine notary. But the boy didn't receive a formal education in ancient and medieval knowledge, an education which was considered indispensable by Renaissance humanists. Latin and Greek were the main fields of thought. He was undoubtedly looked down on throughout his life because of this. People were sure to have said that he was uneducated. But Leonardo eventually assimilated this criticism. In fact, it gave him a certain pride because he had chosen another path to follow, that of the study of nature and the observation of reality. He applied this rule from his very first drawing. Even though he copied the masters, as did his contemporaries, Leonardo da Vinci preferred the direct observation of nature. And thus he was able to reproduce with great precision the rocky forms gouged by the river, the waterfall plunging into the valley, or the mountains which fade into the horizon. When Leonardo did this drawing, he was 21 years old. He had already been living for about 10 years in Florence, where his father had sent him to study painting. At that time, being an artist in Florence was a very lucrative profession. The city invested a great deal, both publicly and privately, in painting, sculpture and architecture. So from his father's point of view, Leonardo's apprenticeship would ensure his son a prosperous future. Around the age of 12, Leonardo became an apprentice to one of the most famous artists in Florence, the goldsmith, sculptor and virtuoso painter Andrea del Verrocchio. In his workshop, where Lorenzo di Credi, Perugino and Sandro Botticelli had been trained, Leonardo started studying all the techniques of drawing, painting and sculpture. In an age of cultural effervescence, the Tuscan city of Florence, governed by the Medici family, was the cradle of the Renaissance. This new intellectual artistic movement placed man at the center of the world and changed the codes of visual representation. In the Middle Ages, nature had been depicted in a stylized way on a gold background as an allegory of the divine world. 
By the beginning of the 15th century, painters began to represent it more faithfully. During Leonardo's time, the imitation of nature was truly a key concept, and he developed the idea that painting was the mirror of nature. He even said that painting should be placed next to a mirror in order to see if the objects were perfectly depicted. In his painting, The Annunciation, painted when he was 20 years old, he experimented with this idea for the first time. He chose to place the angel and the virgin in the middle of a broad landscape that took up almost the entire space of the painting. In the foreground, a bed of flowers in full bloom. In the background, there is a harbor town at the foot of Rocky Mountains. And behind a row of trees, a path winds away up the hillside. With this large panoramic format, Leonardo da Vinci broke new ground. Before him, artists had painted in a square format, and the accent had been placed on mastering perspective, whereas Leonardo concentrated more on the representation of nature. In so doing, he opened the way to new compositions. Lorenzo Di Credi, who also worked in Verrocchio's workshop, promptly took up this new idea. The young Leonardo went even further, thanks to a sculpture in semi-relief, The Incredulity of Saint Thomas, by his master Verrocchio. Verrocchio had been working on the sculpture for the whole time Leonardo had been with him. The statue which shows Saint Thomas and the risen Christ is hollowed out at the back as it was designed to be placed in an alcove and would only be visible from the front. Captivated by the play of shadow and light on the bronze surface, Leonardo decided to use it as a model to reproduce volumes in his painting. In the lives of Renaissance architects, painters and sculptors, published shortly after Leonardo da Vinci's death, Giorgio Vasari describes the painter's work process for studying drapes. Since the 18th century, art historians had thought due to misinterpretation that Leonardo da Vinci worked on his drapes from entirely sculpted models. The curators of the Louvre, after rereading the original edition, claim that his models were in fact bas-reliefs. As with the incredulity of Saint Thomas, he would make a half-length figure on which he placed a cloth immersed in a mixture of clay and water to stiffen it. In so doing, he used a device originally intended for sculpture and modeled large format objects to study the effects of shadow and light. This was the first step towards the study of optics. In order to test this new hypothesis, the curators at the Louvre called upon the help of a young artist specializing in Renaissance techniques who tried to reconstruct a bas-relief from a painted study by Leonardo. I still have some more work to do on it. I haven't been able to get the details right yet, but... It's really remarkable. In comparison to what we saw the other day, it's really impressive. It needed the large format in order to get all the gradations of light and shadow. Only a large format allows this. You can clearly see, in fact, that the smaller model is much more schematic. With this format, we can see the reflections in the interior of the shadow. Do you see this white zone here? It's the reflection of the light on the fabric. The light shines on this part here and is reflected inside. And this is exactly what we see on this drapery. 
What we see here are luminous contrasts, that is, areas of deep shadow, but which are simultaneously illuminated, as if the space contained light. In a famous text by Leonardo da Vinci on sculpture, he states that the superiority of painting comes from the fact that in sculpture, the light is exterior to the work, but in painting, the light is internal. It is inherent in the work. These drapery studies allowed him to bring out spatial structure with great clarity, to render the slightest inflections of light the smallest breaks in the plane. Leonardo took with the rendering of light is seen in his very first painting. It can be seen in the sophistication of the drapery, the transparency of the veils, the relief of the decorated furniture, as well as in the plumage of the angel's wings. The whole of the Virgin's mantle was conceived separately. Leonardo created the entire garment, then transferred it to the wooden panel. These aspects in the construction of the picture tell us a lot about the way Leonardo approached, for the first time in a work of his own, all the elements at the center of his attention. But what proved difficult for Leonardo was finding how to unite all these elements in a single context. The symbiosis between human beings and nature, in which Leonardo da Vinci's later paintings excelled, was not yet fully mastered. To achieve the subtle gradations of shade and transparency, he combined two different painting techniques on the wooden panel. Egg tempera, a mixture of pigments and egg, which he had learned from Verrocchio, and oil painting. Unlike Verrocchio, who nearly always painted with egg tempera, Leonardo preferred oil paints. He favoured the oils that had already been used by several Flemish painters he'd seen working in Florence. But there were also older and contemporary Italian painters who worked with oil paints. Moreover, Leonardo was very curious about what was happening in other Florentine studios near Verrocchio's, particularly in that of the brothers Polaiulo. Antonio and Piero Polaiolo directed Florence's other great workshop. Much appreciated by the Medicis, they painted many portraits of young bourgeois Florentine women. Thanks to oil paints, they achieved a shine in the clothing and a transparency in the skin tones that gave Leonardo the inspiration to use similar techniques in his first portrait painted entirely in oil. His portrait of Ginevra Benci was an important commission. The Venetian ambassador to Florence asked Leonardo to paint this young woman, the object of his platonic love. For this, Leonardo came up with a totally new concept. Flemish painters had already sent many marvelous new paintings to Florence with sitters in three-quarter poses. Da Vinci understood that these were much more lifelike than traditional Italian portraits, always painted in profile. But Da Vinci was not completely free to use this new style, as he had to respect the commission he'd been given. Leonardo da Vinci took inspiration from these new techniques and ideas that were circulating in Florence. He made them his own, and his first portrait astonished Florentine society. But even though the young woman in the painting is turning towards the viewer, she remains stiff and distant, as if lacking any lifelike movement. The painter then embarked on a new quest. After having studied light, he wanted to investigate movement. For to imitate nature fully, it would take more than just copying appearances. 
he would need to know how to reproduce the movement that animates everything that is alive. Leonardo da Vinci achieved this through drawing. And the great many studies and sketches he left behind allow us to comprehend his working process. This is one of the few early drawings that we have by Leonardo at Windsor. It was probably executed in the late 1470s when he was still living and working in Florence. You can see a study of the Madonna kneeling in a landscape, suckling the child with the infant Baptist here. Well, at this early stage in his career, Leonardo tends to use metal point for very careful drawings from the life, but pen and ink, as here, for his more imaginative drawings. With the pen, he could work very quickly over the surface, and simply trying to get a form down as quickly as he can to capture a sense of vivacity. In drawings, he's trying to capture the spontaneity. And then if he can find a way to get that spontaneity held in the composition and expressed in the painting, then the life would be there. Leonardo trusted his instincts. He invented a new drawing technique based on spontaneity of gesture that he called componimento incolto, or instinctive composition. His drawings are astonishing. Leonardo would draw two, three or four figures. His hand would always come back to the concept, always back to the basic concept. He thus created what might appear to be shapeless forms. But from this mass of forms and contours, he managed to find the form best suited to the story he was telling. You have drawings for the Saint Anne where the lamb looks like a llama or even a cat. You're not quite sure what kind of beast it really is. But what's important here is the movement, the energy of the composition. The hand wandering freely to find the right form was something new. It was truly artistic creative liberty. This achievement of freedom through drawing was a turning point in the painter's life. At the age of 28, he received his first major commission, a representation of the adoration of the Magi, and he approached its composition in this new way. The restoration work on this painting, left in the preparatory drawing stage, brings to light Leonardo da Vinci's working process. Analysis demonstrates that the composition was achieved through additions. Da Vinci first positioned all the figures, and then he would stop working on some of them in order to concentrate on others. The sketches were drawn lightly, spontaneously, giving free rein to his creativity. This is clearly seen in the quantity of the lines that define the profile, the attitude, the position and the figure's relationship in the space. Among the profusion of figures, Leonardo da Vinci depicts in the center the Magi gathered in front of Jesus. Around them, the entire crowd is caught in a turmoil that can be seen on every face. Then he let his hand run onto the edges of the wooden panel. There are more than 70 figures in the composition and more than 20 animals, as well as rocks, trees and buildings. 
No other work by Leonardo is of such complexity, neither at this time or even later in his career. The mastery of Leonardo is that, apart from the simple theme, the epiphany, there is his storytelling. He evokes a tale the battle, the construction of the temple, the different characters. And so, in this story, there is also description. What struck us most during the restoration of his painting is the number of elements that Leonardo repeatedly used throughout his career. It's a sort of manifesto. Yes, yes, or like a large notebook. We are unsure why Leonardo da Vinci never finished this painting despite the huge amount of work he had already put into it. He nevertheless maintained his reputation as master of oil painting. It was undoubtedly because he had not mastered the fresco that he was not chosen by the Medicis to represent the Florentine school for the decoration of the Sistine Chapel. Instead, the commission went to Perugino, who had just finished a fresco of St. Sebastian, and Sandro Botticelli, who was working on spring, so it was they who were sent to Rome. Leonardo continued to experiment to enrich his painting. He left for Milan, where he presented himself as engineer, architect, sculptor and painter. At the age of 30, Leonardo became artist of the court of Duke Sforza. He thus enjoyed the freedom and the means to paint as he saw fit for the next 20 years. He did several portraits. They were all painted on black backgrounds in the Milanese tradition. He continued his own research. After movement, it was emotions the painter wanted to capture, for it is emotion that gives expression to a face. He succeeded in this by painting the Duke of Milan's mistress. At the moment, she hears someone arriving. Probably her lover, judging by her expression, at once both surprised and tender. Her faint half-smile. And her hand that caresses the ermine, symbol of purity, which she holds against her heart. Leonardo concentrated on the eyes to give expression to his portraits. The eyes, so-called windows of the soul, reveal the feelings and the intimate emotions of an individual. Leonardo wanted to discover how they worked so as to paint them better. To do so, he performed numerous dissections of human bodies and brains. Well, this is a page from Leonardo's anatomical notebook. He obtained a skull and cut it into a variety of sections to try to understand the relationship between the external form and the internal form of the brain. He wanted to see where the nerves were passing from the eyes and the ears into the brain as part of his campaign to understand how the brain functioned. He wanted to understand how, as a painter, he could depict human emotion. And the way to do that, he thought, was to understand how the senses are received, how they are passed to the brain, how the brain processes them and feels emotion, and then how those emotions go out through the nerves to the muscles, to the face, to the expression. In these drawings, he's already trying to find the point at which the soul is to be found. He believed that where all the senses come together is where the centre of our being is, and therefore where the soul is to be located. 
Dissections were just beginning to be performed by doctors. Leonardo would stop at nothing to understand his art. He appropriated this medical advance to study the human body from the inside and to understand what animates it. Leonardo's challenge in his anatomical work, but I suppose throughout his career, including in his paintings, was how to represent three dimensions in motion and in time in a static two-dimensional image. And in his anatomical drawings, he's experimenting with ways of representation to capture the three-dimensional moving nature of the body. So here in this study of the, the shoulder, he takes the body and he turns it step by step. And he beautifully captures the three-dimensional arrangement of the deltoid muscles over the shoulder there. It's one of the most extraordinary investigations of its period. His research into movement and emotions culminated in his large mural painting, The Last Supper. Here, he simultaneously portrayed no fewer than 13 different emotional states. Today, we have only a few fragile traces left on the walls of the convent of Santa Maria delle Grazie to give us an idea of this masterpiece. But when Leonardo da Vinci's contemporaries saw it, they were amazed at how lifelike Christ and his apostles appeared. A lot of Leonardo's reputation for centuries afterwards rests on the Last Supper. He took what had been a very static traditional composition of the Last Supper, where you have a table with 13 men seated at it, and he transformed this into a, a tableau of, of emotion. And the way in which the emotions are expressed, the violence of the emotions, the novelty of the composition of grouping the apostles into three like this, for everybody who saw it, it was clearly something entirely novel and extraordinary in, in its achievement. Truly, I say to you that one of you shall betray me. These words echo like thunder in the apostles' ears, causing a shockwave that sets in motion the bodies and faces of the guests. Leonardo must have executed many, many studies, maybe hundreds of drawings, but only about six or seven drawings survive for the Last Supper. This is the only one to survive that seems clearly to have been done from the life, where Leonardo is using red chalk to very rapidly sketch an expression of a figure reacting. It's the spontaneity of expression that he's trying to capture here, and then he attempts to maintain that spontaneity in the finished painting. At the age of 46, Leonardo da Vinci painted his first masterpiece with The Last Supper by breaking all the rules. He was no longer painting just the exterior forms, but representing the essence of life. This is what Giorgio Vasari called the modern way. For more than 500 years, Leonardo's composition has influenced paintings of this biblical episode. Leonardo believed that he needed much more objectivity in his art. He thus embarked on what he called the science of painting. He became aware that painting could be a truly universal art, a very profound art, very powerful, which had need of a scientific basis. Leonardo da Vinci began writing his treatise on the science of painting when he arrived in Milan. His ambition was to transcribe all the knowledge and skill that he considered necessary to a painter's work. The work included procedures and technical advice 
as well as all his reflections and experiments on the world around him. Leonardo believed that every object painted required a sustained effort in the garnering of knowledge. To depict a tree, he observed the effect of sun on its leaves, and he also studied the flow of sap inside the trunk. This approach eventually led him to the study of all the sciences. Very quickly, he realized that that treatise would contain far more than could be fitted into a single work. So soon he starts to think about a treatise on anatomy, and then a treatise on optics, on light and shade and color and atmospherics, then on water, then plants, and then the movement of animals. Leonardo da Vinci was never to finish this monumental project. More than half of the painter's writings have disappeared. But today, we still have several thousand pages of drawings and notes that give us an idea of the painter's ambitions. See some large drawings done with compass and ruler. But around those geometrical diagrams, he starts to fit other observations. He draws clouds in great detail, showing the fall of light on clouds, a downpour of rain into a flooded landscape, Plants are beautifully drawn grass there, and we see a man's profile, which then, as he adds the drapery, goes down into a tree, a horse and rider, studies of engineering. So, so many different subjects, but what seems to be quite disconnected as he works on these different subjects gradually grows together into a single body of knowledge. The extent of his research might have suggested that Leonardo was more interested in science than in painting. But in fact, the sole aim of his scientific research was to nourish his art. because Leonardo da Vinci considered painting as the most important of all the sciences, the only one that could depict the beauty and mystery of the world. His intuition told him there was a dynamic engraved into the core of creation, a physical and spiritual driving force that generated life. Leonardo wanted to establish a single big truth about the universe. He thought that all aspects of the universe, all the physical laws of the universe were connected. Everything that you can see in the visible universe was intimately related. And he wanted to bring all this knowledge to bear on his paintings. Leonardo was a great theoretician but he said in his treatise on painting, over and above theory, there is something even greater, and that is pictorial creation, the work of the artist's hand. For Leonardo, the hand was the moment of truth. Would it be able to represent all the concepts in his mind, represent all that life and the rhythm of the world? During his stay in Milan, Leonardo da Vinci confirmed his work process, placing the perfection of the pictorial gesture at the service of humanist thought. After his years of scientific research and his masterpiece, The Last Supper, he was recognized as the court's leading painter. But in 1500, he lost his protector when Duke Sforza was overthrown by the French army. Leonardo was forced to return to Florence. At 50 years of age and now without a patron, Leonardo da Vinci devoted the last 20 years of his life to producing three masterpieces, The Virgin and Child with Saint Anne, Mona Lisa, and Saint John the Baptist. He would be free to begin paintings without having a sponsor looking over his shoulder. In fact, that's why he kept all his last works of art with him, 
He painted them calmly, in his own time, and he died with his paintings. And these paintings are all unfinished because they are of personal experiences. They are paintings that bear witness to the way he approached his work. The painter could allow himself the freedom to work without being commissioned and to express his personal poetic vision of the world. This approach, revolutionary at the time, made Leonardo a forerunner of modernity. The Virgin and Child with Saint Anne is a brilliant synthesis of his art. He makes use of all his technical skills, his philosophical obsessions, and his graphic inventiveness. But above all, the work is the incomplete culmination of a long creative process that had begun in 1503. Over 20 years, da Vinci made major changes to his composition, modified the story it told, and never stopped perfecting each of his character's movements in order to finally depict what he thought was the strongest trait of the story and the most telling from a spiritual point of view. In a first full-scale draft of the painting, da Vinci shows Jesus on his mother's knee, blessing the child John the Baptist. Saint Anne places herself between them, looking at her daughter and pointing heavenwards to indicate her son's tragic destiny. Then John the Baptist is replaced by a lamb, symbol of the sacrifice of Christ. Each stage in the slow progression of the creation of this painting can be observed by studying the copies made by the apprentices that Leonardo trained in his studio. Today, we know that these copies are like photos of the different ideas that Leonardo had for each of his projects. They give us clues that help us understand how Leonardo had not only changed the shape of his compositions, but had also changed their iconography. I would say that it's rather a new way of looking at the modern day, today's art historians. We realized that the act of painting was really very important for Leonardo and that each of his projects was in some way a great moment of truth for him, a long, slow, patient and meticulous process of seeking perfection. From his first drawings, the Florentines were fascinated by the work and the pyramid style of its composition. His influence was evident from the very beginning of the 16th century and contributed to a pictorial renewal. In particular, one of his contemporaries, the young Raphael, took inspiration from it for several of his Madonnas. But it is the incredible technical finesse of the work that is also dazzling. The transparency of the water running over the stones, the lightness of the veils, and the diaphanous mountains that seem to dissolve into the distance. Leonardo da Vinci rendered this impression of distance through his mastery of atmospheric perspective. When you get closer to the Saint Anne, you get the impression that it's almost a watercolour. There is such an extraordinary effect of transparency, it's full of quite unimaginable subtleties that play with variations of blue through a whole range of greys to white. He was an artist who found the language of painting, the language of drawing, a total practical freedom. And from a wider perspective, you could say that breaking away from the constraint of imitating nature, a vista opened up that would lead us to the abstract. Today, we are intrigued by Leonardo da Vinci's way of painting. Even though he used the paintbrush, we know that he also used his fingers, multiplied the layers of glazing, tried for effects of transparency. At the research center of the Museums of France, they have just started the restoration of a painting depicting Bacchus 
that certainly came from Leonardo's workshop. The experts are looking for evidence of the master's hand. How far have you got? I think you've made progress on the background. Yes, I've got on with the background, and I've worked on the eyes. You can't see it very well, but the eyes are actually quite pale. What do you mean, they're brown? No, no, no. No, they're blue. Blue? Blue-gray, actually. In any case, the painting is very much in the style of Leonardo da Vinci. The St. John figure is physically typical. The hair, even the depiction of nature. It's refined, but at the same time, a bit stilted. A real Leonardo would give a greater sense of volume. The volume of the plants would be more developed. I think they're very beautiful. This is very meticulous. You can tell that the person is doing their best. It's not bad, you can't deny it, but it's still not genuine da Vinci. Today, the interest shown in his works of art proves to us that da Vinci was passionate about painting, about the act of painting. The most important moment in each of his projects wasn't so much the lengthy intellectual and graphic reflection on the project, but rather the equally lengthy pictorial execution of the work. The Mona Lisa is the perfect example of this. Da Vinci began painting it in the early 1500s and carried on working on it for the rest of his life. The starting point for this painting was not something grandiose. It really is the portrait of a middle-class Florentine lady. But Da Vinci eventually became infused by the portrait and sought to make it the emblem of his art. In other words, his ambition was for his painting to be not only a perfect representation of life, but also the movement of life and all the magical expression of humanity. But this work is not merely a portrait. In the background, Leonardo da Vinci has painted a landscape that by a subtle interplay of echoes with the woman, reminds us that the human being is linked to that which surrounds him. We only see rather stark rocky shapes, and the water seems to swirl around these rocks and mountains. We get a sort of impression that Leonardo wants to retranscribe the story of the world, this violent struggle of the elements, earth and water, unceasingly damaging each other. We always have the impression that he likes to represent a story, a character, in this long history not merely of humanity, but the history of the earth itself. The element of time is something that was so crucial to Leonardo, and bringing it into a painting through having figures in motion through the landscape itself that shows mountains being weathered down, rivers flowing and so on. He's expressing time at different levels, both deep geological, historical time, but also the time by which an organism, a human being, is born and lives and dies. And all these come together in Leonardo's paintings. A portrait that becomes a meditation on the passage of time. With the Mona Lisa, Leonardo da Vinci stretches a line between this smiling young woman from the beginning of the 16th century and us, who still gaze at her today. It is really a work that is made to be a dialogue with the observer. It has the dimension, it's on a human scale, she turns towards us, as you can see, sitting slightly sideways on her seat. We've just arrived. She's starting to smile, and that shows all the magic of the interaction starting between two human beings with all the potential and all the ambiguity that that could involve. And that is why the painting still fascinates us today. Because it's the emblem not only of Leonardo da Vinci, but also of what life is, the psychological and emotional richness of a living being. The ambiguity of life, which so fascinated Leonardo da Vinci, is expressed in the very sweet, gentle smile of Mona Lisa. The closer you get, the more it slips away. Is it appearing or disappearing? Leonardo conveys this impression with his famous sfumato, an effect that softens the contours and clouds them in a faint smokiness. Mm -hmm. 
scientific imagery can reveal painter's preparatory work. X-ray images when used on Leonardo da Vinci's works are unlike any others. They show up as blurred, almost phantom images. The very small quantity of pigments he used doesn't allow us to distinguish the outlines, unlike, for example, the X-ray photos of a Raphael painting of the same period, La Belle Jardinière. There are no visible brush marks, as if the artist had painted by magic. The superposing of many fine layers of paint make all the painter's brush strokes invisible. They confirm that Leonardo's paintings are the result of meticulous thought and execution perfected over time. At the end of his life, with his strength failing, Leonardo da Vinci felt he would never be able to achieve what he had undertaken. One question haunted him. What would remain of him after his death? For Leonardo, for somebody who had, during his career, seen some of his works destroyed, many of his works left unfinished. His scientific treatises had come to nothing. He must have had a strong sense of the impermanence of all things. In these last couple of years, he's becoming increasingly obsessed by, by death and destruction and visions of a, of a huge storm, a tempest overwhelming the earth, causing cities to be swept away, mountains to collapse, and ultimately nothing solid being left on earth at all. And these drawings seem to me an expression of that. They seem to me Leonardo's final, rather despairing attempt to understand the forces of the universe. And yet it was at the peak of his renown that in 1515 he crossed the Alps into France, accepting an invitation from the young King Francois I. At 64 years of age, Leonardo da Vinci at last found with the French king the recognition he had always sought in Rome. It was here, in the chateau of Clos Lucé in Amboise, that Leonardo da Vinci spent the last years of his life in the company of his last three paintings that he had brought with him, the Saint Anne, the Mona Lisa, and the Saint John the Baptist. In his John the Baptist, pared down to utter simplicity, every trace of nature in the landscape has disappeared. The painter plays with the pictorial dimensions of light and shade, enhanced by his subtle sfumato technique. In the New Testament, it's John the Baptist who announces the coming of Christ. It's really the first light that springs forth in the darkness. All is just light and shadow to evoke the play between appearing and disappearing. This John the Baptist, this light apparition in the dark, is there to lead us to see, to look at the darkness and discover the light. The light delicately sculpts the saint's body his movement reminding us of a living flame. Leonardo also invokes his more spiritual depth. That hand pointing to heaven really symbolizes the idea that in our material world, the world of mankind, there is a divine presence. We must also imagine that above us there is God, ever present and intervening in the affairs of men. So it's really a very significant gesture, full of meaning. It appears for the first time in the Adoration of the Magi, then we find another version in the Last Supper, and some years later, it reappears in the sketch for Saint Anne. This gesture seems to have haunted the whole of Leonardo's work. Until the end of his life, he returned again and again to his paintings. In his obsessive quest for perfection, the artist still found the strength to add a few patches of color to St. Anne's dress. 
These were his final brush strokes before his death. Leonardo da Vinci died at the age of 67 on the 2nd of May, 1519. He had never had the time to finish these thousands of pages of notes so that they could be published during his lifetime. Neither did he have time to complete his paintings. But did he really want to complete them? His absolute ambition to recreate the world through painting is a quest that can be pursued and reinvented into infinity. In one of his last drawings, a young woman encourages us to follow her, inviting us even today to feel the eternal rhythm of the world, which Leonardo da Vinci expressed in all its mystery and beauty.